obviously in that skit there was a lot more going off stage that you weren't privy to, but that the students in the live class when I taped that a few years ago uh, really were just going ape watching, particularly my daughter, just uh, do anything, just anything for applause, anything for people to clap. Um, but besides the beautiful skit there, there actually is a little bit of law that is taking place. Essentially, that whole skit deals with damages. Uh, and let's ignore again that the players lack capacity. Let's assume they have uh, capacity and just focus on a contract which I entered into with the oldest child, Paul, for $8 an item. And assume it's a good contract. And then Paul breaches and goes off to play in the World Series. And I end up having to cover by paying $11 to Laura. So there's an $8 contract price, an $11 cover price. And in the meantime, of course, I'm also losing out on some sales. People such as Daniel, the, the smaller boy, come by and uh, they can't find the item. They leave outraged. They don't buy that item. Maybe they don't buy some other goods as well. And so during that intervening period where I don't have the item when I should have, I lose out on some sales, some of the retail sales at $16 an item I don't get to, uh, to have. Now, obviously, I have kept out a lot of factors in this scenario, and you could certainly talk about them in some of your other classes. I don't view that as my role as a uh, business law prof to be going into the minutia of various damages elements. We just don't have time for that. But you could obviously complicate this factor by talking about interest and depreciation and inventory and stocking and uh, other aspects of overhead, all sorts of issues that affect what would be the precise calculation of damages. I'm just trying to give you the broad parameters, the basics, so we can focus on that. Uh, damages, there are many, many different elements of damages. And just to show you how complex it can get, uh, I brought in, we don't need to, you don't need to see it, but it's a copy of uh, junk mail I received for a two-volume set. Hardbound, two-volume set, must be about 2,000 pages or more altogether. And all it is is on recovery of damages for lost profits. This was the fourth edition of that work, two-volume set. All it's dealing with is lost profits. So you can imagine how much there is out there on profits generally, on other elements of damages, if you can have two volumes simply dealing with some cases on lost profits. The courts do not view contract breaches as some sort of moral quagmire or dilemma. And I think sometimes people believe that, oh, if I am in the right in a lawsuit, then I can really stick it to the other side. You see those bumper stickers sometimes saying, follow me closely, then hit me, I could use the money. You know, the whole idea is they're going to sue you for damages and they're going to really hit the jackpot. Well, most of the time that doesn't work out, whether it's in tort law and certainly in contract law. It's not like you're going to make some huge windfall most of the time. In contract law, for instance, damages are assessed typically simply based on compensating the innocent party, the non-breaching party, for his harm. Either restoring him to the status quo ante or bringing him to the position he would have been if the contract had been fully and correctly performed. But not giving him some additional amount, some windfall. And the rationale is breaches of contract are not necessarily wrong. They're simply decisions which, if you do choose to, to breach, you ought to at least pay the piper. You ought to at least pay the consequences for that, but no more. So we've got this element of damages. The compensatory damages are the direct ones. They're the ones that you can easily see simply comparing the contract to what you then had to do to cover for yourself. So direct damages here would be three dollars per item that you had to buy from Laura since Paul had gone away and breached the contract. So it would be three times whatever number of items you uh, had the contract to buy from Paul. 
Those are your direct damages. Indirect, sometimes called consequential damages, really are a type of damage intended to compensate the non-breaching parties. So you could call them compensatory damages, but frankly, most courts, lots of lawyers, will call them consequential damages and will not necessarily view consequential damages as simply a subset of compensatory damages. That's simply a question of nomenclature, of semantics. I don't think it really matters as long as you know what they're going towards. Consequential damages go towards indirect costs, things like lost profits. So, for instance, in this case, the consequential damages would be every one of the sales that I was not able to effectuate because I didn't have the item for whatever that time period was where I was trying to cover, trying to get the best next deal available. I lost out on, on some sales. And obviously, those sales, uh, I should be able to get the $5 in addition beyond the $3 for the cover price differential. Those $5 in addition from $11 up to the $16 for retail sales, which I missed out on because I couldn't make any sales to Daniel or people like him. There should never be windfall, though. You should never get a duplication of this amount of damage or of this amount of damage. You should only be getting what is just, what is fair to compensate you. One last point, and that is when we talk about lost profits, the profits are gauged based on prior experience, based on the season, say if it's a seasonal type of uh, transaction, based on all of the overwhelming circumstances that the courts look at. What really makes it difficult for new businesses is there's no track record to go on, nothing to gauge what their profits might have been because we don't know what they have been in the past. It's a new business. So typically, lost profits are not available to new businesses. We simply try to restore them to the status quo ante. Uh, and for businesses that do have a track record, we look at their past record to give us some guidance for what their profits would have been so that it is not highly speculative. Courts hate to speculate. They want to look at demographics. They want to look at past sales. They want to look at store traffic. If necessary, they even want to look at any upsurge that your competitors may have had in their sales so that we could perhaps allocate some of that to the fact that you weren't temporarily in that line of business because you didn't have the goods. But you want something that you can go on rather than mere speculation. Courts don't like giving windfalls. They don't like punishing. People may show up all dressed in gold thinking, oh, I'm going to really sock it to the other side. But really what they have to do is show up with lots of good documentation as to why what occurred was a breach and as to exactly how their damages are to be ferreted out. When you sue someone for breach of contract, you really have three essential elements you need to prove. You need to prove that there was a contract. You need to prove that the defendant breached it. And then, perhaps most important, you need to show what, in fact, your damages have been. Absent all three of those, uh, any one of those elements, you really don't have a winning case. And then your next step, of course, which we've already alluded to, is even if you do win a damages award, by golly, you better hope they actually have some money or some insurance or some other mechanism for actually paying you. Okay, that's it for that skit. That whole scenario involves, as the title implies, warranties. And because warranties, which arise out of contract, are often subject to all sorts of fantastic claims, either by people asserting a warranty or defenses uh, created by minds saying there were no warranties or, in fact, the warranty was met or it was otherwise disclaimed, 